To humans, wake up, wise up, do what you can, individually and together. Let's go back in time about a few hundred million years. You're a plant, and you're a plant that's been evolving alongside microorganisms, fungi, and animals. But come to find out, everyone finds you extremely tasty. You naturally don't like being eaten, but you're a plant, and you can't just walk away. So what can you do against all these predators? You could modify your leaves into thorns, or equip them with tiny, irritating hairs, But maybe you decide to go a different route and develop chemical toxins to deter your opponent. Perhaps upon ingesting this toxin, insects find you instantly deadly. Perhaps small mammals find themselves immobilized and disoriented by your effects and learn to leave you alone. But perhaps early hominids find a way to carefully dose your toxins and use them for medicine or even recreation. That's the topic of my conversation today with Dr. One R. Pagan and his latest book, Drunk Flies and Stoned Dolphins, A Trip Through the World of Animal Intoxication. We'll discuss how naturally occurring compounds in our environment have been used and abused, both intentionally and unintentionally, by members of the animal kingdom. We'll learn about cigarette-wielding birds, LSD-induced elephants, and big cats crazy for catnip. As always, we'd love to hear from you about this episode, so leave us a review and follow us on social media at earth to humans Pod. My name is Serena Simons, and here's my conversation with Dr. One R. Pagan. So my name is Serena Simons. I'm the senior producer on the Earth to Humans podcast, and I originally saw the cover of the book that we're going to talk about today, your book um, by Dr. One Pagan um, at the at my local bookstore, and I was just totally intrigued by the cover right off the bat, Drunk Flies and Stoned Dolphins. Like, what, is, what does that mean, you know? So it was definitely an intriguing, enticing book cover, and it got me really excited to read it. And, you know, over the course of reading it, I, you can ask any of any number of my friends, you know, just over the course, like, did you know this? Like, I just learned this in this book and it's crazy. And did you know, you know, so I was just really geeking out on all the content. But um, Dr. Pagan, I just wondered if you could go ahead and introduce yourself. I know you've probably done this a million times, but give us a little bit about you, your background, what the heck got you interested in this topic? And we'll go from there. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Serena. And please call me One. Uh, The title is for the students. (laughs) uh, And here we are just two like-minded people uh, talking and, uh, you know, I'm just having fun. I'm just having fun. Uh, Well, uh, my name is One Pagan. Thank you for saying it right, by the way. (laughs) Uh, Has those two accents. Yes, it does. Yeah, Uh, yeah, it does. Uh, It's a a weird story because my name, it's it's kind of Greek. Uh, but I'm Puerto Rican, <laughs> go figure. Uh, my father's name was Onesimos, and that's a Bible name. And his nickname was One. So I was his first firstborn, so here we are. But when I moved to the mainland, I'm one. <laughs> and, <laughs> and my last name is Pagan, so it's I'm one pagan. Uh, I was a non-traditional student. I did my bachelor's and master's at the University of Puerto Rico. And well, in the between degrees, I worked. Okay, uh, I met my wife, started having the family, you know, the, things like that. I always wanted to do my PhD, but well, I had a family. <laughs> I needed to work. So at 35, I got the opportunity to come to the mainland 
a collaborator of my master's thesis advisors uh, from Cornell University came to Puerto Rico to recruit students. He invited me to apply. I did apply. They admitted it. And basically, uh, I, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but I told my wife it's freaking Cornell. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and, and and I was 35 at this at the time, so it's a a, a completely non-traditional student. Uh, so we moved to the mainland. Our youngest kid uh, was born in Ithaca, uh, New York, and that was 20 years ago. <laughs> okay, so I'm now a professor of biology at Westchester University in Pennsylvania, and I am a pharmacologist by training. That's uh, my bachelor's is in general science. I, I, I couldn't commit. Okay, I, I took like astronomy, biochemistry, things like that. My master's is in actually biochemistry and my PhD is in pharmacology with a strong emphasis on neurobiology. Why am I writing, uh, why did I write a book uh, about animal intoxication? Uh, because my research deals uh, with exactly that. I work uh, with planarians, uh, these flatworm, flatworms that you can cut their heads off and they will regrow a head and a brain. I essentially study uh, abused drugs in them uh, to see if we can, well, to, to elucidate aspects of pharmacology, uh, drug rec recovery, things like that. So, and if you don't okay. stop me, I will keep talking. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, you bring up your wife a couple times in the book. And, you know, when you are talking about your research with the flatworms, you were talking about a couple other scientists that named their discoveries after their spouses. And you made a, a joke about maybe your wife wouldn't appreciate you know, being immortalized as the name of a flatworm. So uh. <laughs> that, that, I got the idea from a, a story of a, of a scientist. I don't remember his name, but I know the story. He discovered a very beautiful wasp and, uh, and he named it after his wife because it was a, as delicate, as beautiful as his wife. But I mean, not very many people will describe flatworms as pretty, and, yes. uh, and my, my Lisa will take uh, issue with that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess before we get into the content, how does your family feel about the work that you do? Uh, well, uh, I, I would like to think, uh, well, they've told me that they're, well, they're, they're proud of me and everything. They support me. Uh, my wife is also a scientist. She's a medical technologist. Amazing. Uh, yeah, so she's uh, way smarter than I'll ever be, and... and <laughs> And yeah, I don't know how how I cut her eye, frankly, but that, but that's another story. <laughs> and uh, but uh, weirdly, none of our children uh, likes uh, science in that sense, because uh, our daughter she's thirty one, she's a psychology ma major, and our boys uh, twenty four and twenty. They have no interest in science whatsoever. <laughs> uh, so I, I guess it's going to skip a generation. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so maybe your grandkids will be uh, science nerds. Um, but, you know, let's kind of get into the, the content of the book, um, which was a, a, a beautiful and funny read, by the way. You know, it, it was so thoroughly researched. And you have a great distinction in the book where you um, kind of the majority of the book is is – um, material that you have great citations for, well-documented evidence um, of events, um, you know, and then you have kind of the, the final chapter, which is more sort of anecdotal, maybe some some science that still needs to be, um, you know, worked out. But um, the, the bulk of the book is, is well-documented and well-studied uh, examples of drug use in the animal kingdom. Um, so I guess what what is the importance of that for you? I know you're a scientist, you know, and the importance of having a book that's so well researched and, um, you know, even if there are kind of cool stories that you came across along the way, the importance of having those um, be science-based, evidence-based things that you wanted to cover. Yeah, well, uh, again, thank you for being so kind with uh, with. With, with uh, your words uh, towards the book, uh, I mean, uh, I decided to write a popular science, but I'm fastidious about uh, researching my sources, uh, uh, okay, because for two reasons. Uh, I want to state something that is uh, true uh, for my readers, and I want to give credit where credit's due. Uh, and that's kind of the way science should be done, okay? 
but at the same time, I want to respect my reader, even uh, if they are, are not involved in science uh, whatsoever. I, I don't like to be uh, patronizing or anything like that because anybody has the capacity to understand science mm -hmm. if interested enough. And even if you are not, are not going to study science in a professional level, we live in a society that is technological. And so everybody has to know at least uh, a little bit about science. And, uh, and it's fun. I, I mean, I, I love learning about nature. And there's so many things that we can learn about uh, animals and plants and fungi that are surprisingly similar to, to ourselves. Uh, I mean, who in their right mind would think that flies can get drunk? Uh, 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 okay, so... Uh, uh, and from there, once I began researching uh, the, the book in terms of other animals, I discovered so many things and, and, and so many stories. And so uh, we, it was a pleasure to write. Uh, and, uh, and again, I, I, I cannot let go the opportunity to thank the people at Bembella. Uh, because everybody there, from my editors, uh, Alexa, she's my my master Jedi, <laughs> as it were, and everybody there is so awesome. Mm -hmm. I I just I love your personality. You know, I I, I felt like you know, when I was reading the book, I could kind of get a sense of you as a person. And I'm so happy to report that you as a person is just exactly how I pictured you. Um, you know, you guys can't see One, but he's in a Hawaiian shirt. You know, he's got cool art in the back of his office. So, you know, you're just, it, it comes across in your writing that you are trying to um, reach people and entertain people, but entertain them with real evidence-based science, you know, and I thought that that was really cool. Yeah, I'm sorry for interrupting. It's just that I remember that in that sense, you know what I think I'm, I'm getting that, uh, I don't know, ability from? Because for the last maybe six or seven years, I've been teaching a course of biology for non-majors, okay? Mm -hmm. Meaning that I get majors from, uh, except for science, from all over the university, so that means that a significant portion of them are no interested in biology whatsoever. So I have to be a performer uh, too. Let me give you an example. And I can send you the picture later on. A Halloween, one Halloween I, wear, well, I went dressed as Darth Vader. Uh, uh, okay, and I pic uh, I projected a picture say, join me and I will teach you the ways of biology. Uh, and and I, I, and, you know, I, I like telling lame jokes, dad jokes, because we are all also conditioned to a few minutes of close attention followed by distractions. Okay, so I tell a stupid joke, a dad joke, everybody give me a courtesy laugh, a groan or whatever, but I reset their attention and they come back to me. Yeah. And there are, there are many dad jokes spread throughout uh, the book, which is really great. <laughs> um, so let's kind of get into it, I guess. So one of the first things that I kind of was making a note of was this, the stoned ape theory. And, you know, you kind of go, you cover both camps, the camp that finds that theory very exciting, very credible. And then another camp that's like, eh, I don't know, you know, so maybe for, in your opinion, can you kind of, kind of give a, a, a breakdown of what the stoned ape theory is and then maybe your personal opinions on where you fall in and how likely you think that theory is. Okay, well, the Stone Ape Theory, uh, you said it very well. I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of you either hate it or love it, <laughs> okay? Uh, but there's some evidence, uh, compelling, well, let's say suggestive evidence that, uh, again, suggests that it may be uh, correct. The thing is that people uh, postulated that the jump from animal to human consciousness, whatever consciousness is, okay, because we don't really have a, a good definition of that, was uh, kindled by the consumption of psychoactive substances. Uh, more specifically, <laughs> from fungi that grew in animal dung. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so there's uh, the jokes right themselves, uh, <laughs> right there. Uh, but uh, then again, uh, it has, there's some evidence uh, for that. It's undeniable that people encounter this type of psychoactive, a psychoactive fungi uh, anywhere. I mean, nowadays people do that too. Uh, uh, I'm not advocating for that. Children, 
if you see a, 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 a mushroom, don't eat it. Don't eat it. Yeah, don't eat it. Could kill you. Yeah, exactly. So admire it, take a selfie with it, but keep keep walking. So, no, but but that's, uh, then again, uh, there's nothing, there's no people as picky, uh, as nitpicky, I should say, as scientists. <laughs> okay, because and they uh, they like to philosophize. We like to philosophize. We, uh, philosophize. We like to debate and whatever. But as far as the stone ape theory, I mean, there's suggestive evidence, but there's actually no proof. Okay, it's uh, uh, it's similar to the drunken monkey hypothesis. Uh, okay, so and uh, and that there's more evidence for that one if you want to talk about it. Mm-hmm. The stone ape theory, though, it, it's really captivating because I feel like it helps answer a lot of unanswerable questions about our place in the universe, what it all means, you know, and sort of thinking about early humans and how we created language and religion and art and community and all of these things that make us so special with our big giant brains. But that big gap in... in, in an unknown of how we got there. You know, it's kind of like the, the big bang theory. It's like, it's a very, it, it makes sense scientifically, but it's also like, but, but what does that mean? Like that it's, it's still kind of a crazy concept to get your mind around. And it's crazy. I, I agree with you. That's probably the only fair description uh, the, uh, of these type of things. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And with the drunken monkey hypothesis, you know, we've got, I guess, sort of a, a caloric, need a physiological need behind some of that so can you kind of get into what that theory means and um where you fall in that one too okay so uh in that that one we have more evidence uh for them actually more experimental evidence uh for that one too uh because i mean people observe that uh, monkeys sometimes they tend to uh prefer fermented fruit as opposed to fresh uh, fruit and people have actually observed monkeys that they you know get their their fill uh, with fruit and then they just fall uh, from the tree and people have actually hypothesized that it is, it's kind of a, a nutritional uh, context okay because alcohol is very nutritious that's why when they put you in a diet one of the things that they tell you well don't drink beer uh, or don't drink, you know. Uh, but then again, there's some other psychoactive effects that we have to take into consideration. So take, for example, alcohol in a fruit. You also take your vitamins, for example, uh, and, and all these type of things. So it's more of a nutritional as opposed to a recreational context, as mm-hmm. in the stone ape theory. So mm-hmm. I, I guess that if, if I would love for both uh, the- hypotheses, <laughs> to, for them to be true, and because they, in a romantic setting, in, in a way that it would be awesome, okay? But uh, the, the jury is still out there, uh, I yeah. would say. Any research that you are going to be doing that has anything to do with answering that big question with your, your flatworms? No, no. Because the, the thing about it is that I'm, I'm an atypical biologist. Part of the reason that why I use flatworms for, uh, uh, besides for the serendipitous road that took me here is that I would feel very uneasy doing experiments on monkeys uh, or, or, or even rats. Uh, uh, okay, so I, I, I mean, anybody who's had a pet know that they feel that they have feelings. I mean, if you're a dog person, cat person, it doesn't matter. They have feelings, okay? Uh, dogs adore you. Cats expect you to adore them. <laughs> that, that's a different... Uh, but but they have feelings, and I, uh, and I wouldn't bring... I, I cannot bring myself to, to experiment uh, on, uh, quote-unquote, higher animals. And that's one of my pet peeves. No animal is higher than the other, but let, let, let's not go there. <laughs> But that brings up a good point is just kind of the overarching thoughts in the book is how do we measure what animals experience, you know, on these psychoactive substances? How do we gauge if a fly is drunk? How do we gauge, you know, how do we, how do we understand the experience of these animals? Some of them, you know, octopus that have such different realities to our own and senses and, and sight and smell and it, it, there's just the gambit and so 
maybe we can get into that a little bit is like, how do you, how do you write a book about animals when you can't speak for the animal? You know, how do you, how do you do science on creatures that can't tell you how they're feeling and what they're experiencing? Yeah, but the, the best we can do is to observe their behaviors. This is not a difficulty that it's limited to work with animals. I, I like telling my, my research students, I don't even know what I'm thinking half of the time, okay? Let alone how an, an animal feels or, or another person. So but what we do, for example, I can tell you that if we give uh, my worms, well, the worms that I work with, <laughs> okay, uh, uh, nicotine, Okay, and we leave nicotine there for a certain period of time. We take the nicotine away. They get into, for all intents and purposes, withdrawal. They start shaking. They swim like crazy. I work with freshwater and flatworms. They they get. Uh, it's really funny. They latch their tails at the bottom of the petri dish and they go like a cobra, uh, uh, as if looking. Yeah, as if they were wow. looking for. So. And those responses responses can be quantified. Okay, the more uh, nicotine we give them, and the more we, uh, the sooner we take it away, the more they twitch. For example, and we can actually uh, design experiments to try to come up with substances that can counteract those behavioral effects or even toxicity. Mm -hmm. And there was a great example you brought up in the book, um, kind of towards the end about Tusco the elephant. And uh, that was a pretty sad story. And I, I thought it was really interesting that that experiment was able to happen. Um, but I, I guess, so there's the, there's observations, right? And so with, with an animal like Tesco, um, basically, and, and you can correct me where I'm getting this all wrong here, but um, these scientists wanted to understand this phenomena in elephants called must, in which males... They get hyper aggressive and, you know, there's just a, seems to be a lot of testosterone flowing and a lot of territorial behavior. Um, and they kind of wanted to understand what was happening there. And so they did a bunch of different experiments and they ended up giving Tesco and a couple other ele elephants LSD. Um, and it didn't really go that well. Do you want to get into that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, first, you're absolutely right. This, this type of experiment would never fly today, uh, okay, because uh, there's more regulations, or rightfully so, ab about these type of things. So uh, it's never been clear to me why these uh, two scientists thought that by giving LSD to an elephant, they uh, would uh, replicate the phenomenon of must. Uh, because in general, uh, and I mean... Uh, anecdotically, okay? A person who gets high on LSD, uh, they don't tend to get aggressive. <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of the opposite. But the thing is that, well, they did it. But then, <laughs> for lack of a better term, Tosco, uh, what he did was to, he got like dizzy or whatever and he fell. And in their efforts to try to revive him, they injected him with a bunch of like the kitchen, proverbial kitchen sink. That's probably what killed Tusco. Not an LSD uh, overdose, uh, even though they also overdose him uh, in LSD. So uh, also they allowed Tusco to be uh, injected with LSD in the same enclosure with two much smaller uh, females. If they expect, What's more dangerous than an angry bull elephant, okay? A high angry bull elephant, uh, uh, okay? So what did they expect was going to happen? Well, anyway, hindsight is twenty twenty. okay? But uh, then they replicated the experiments uh, with, uh, again, smaller elephants and whatnot, and they got more or less uh, the expected results, okay? The same scientist tried to get elephant drunks. Uh, elephants drunk, sorry. And get, I get enthusiastic on my accent, uh, uh, you know. Uh, Comes out, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> but the same scientist, uh, he actually got like a big metal drum full of alcohol-laced uh, water, and he would drive it in a Jeep uh, to an elephant, and they will let them, uh, let the elephants drink to their uh, leisure. And they did that in a small population. And as expected, they uh, observe different effects, just like people who get drunk. Some of them are angry drunks. 
Some of them are sad drunks, like silly drunks. And he got all of the above. In more than one time, he had to step on the gas and get out of Dutch. Uh, because, uh, again, uh, the elephant was angry and drunk. Uh, okay, so, but that, that's why I work with flatworms. <laughs> You know, they cannot bite me, they cannot eat me, they cannot <laughs> hurt me. Low chance of getting workers' comp uh, from a <laughs> flatworm. <laughs> um, but that, that example was really interesting in the book because I think while simultaneously showing us how different substances affect different animals because of their different biology, there's a lot of similarity. There's a thread of similarity and so, you know, with the, that experiment where they were giving al alcohol to elephants, you do have a different range in how the same substance affects the same species, but different individuals of the same species. And we're not immune to that, too, because we're just mammals. So I thought that was really interesting. And it kind of brought it back to our own humanness as being part and physiologically part of the same the same stuff <laughs> as all of these animals too, even, even invertebrates, you know, like I thought that was really cool. Um, so I, one thing that I want to kind of ask you about is you have this, you have this great moment in the book about plants and you kind of set the stage for plants and how plants kind of evolve to have some of these toxins to stave off uh, predation from animals, you know, as animals kind of evolved alongside plants, but that, but you talk about how plants evolved alongside each other too, and how plants started, they had to compete with each other first. So I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. But yeah, I mean, that's something that uh, I had a lot of fun educating myself uh, in that because I'm not a plant person. Uh, but as I read about it, I got, again, very enthusiastic. So one, and I was not immune to that. Uh, I used to think, well, that plants were plants. They, 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 they were just there, <laughs> okay? And, and they exist and they are clever in their own way. And it's just that they uh, live at a time frame that it's much slower than ours, uh, okay? But that being said, they uh, more than compensate for the relative uh, slowness and lack of motility by being master chemists. Uh, because pretty much all the substances that are psychoactive in mammals, including humans, and for, uh, I don't know, nicotine, uh, nicotine uh, cocaine, morphine, uh, uh, all those were, again, uh, first found in plants, and the current thinking is that they were used as, an, as natural insecticides. Uh, okay, so and uh, uh, through evolution, uh, eventually they found their way to us. And for example, a certain amount of nicotine to a tiny insect uh, will kill it, but the same amount of nicotine to a person it will induce a certain psychoactive pleasurable uh, effect. Uh, uh, okay, so then another process of evolution like uh, selection. Uh, began because, uh, like, I don't know, 50,000 years ago, the people noticed that if they use kindling of cannabis plants, they will be happy. <laughs> and hungry. Uh, uh, and hungry, exactly. But then they will say, well, this I like this plant. They will protect the plant from grazing animals. Uh, agriculture began. <laughs> okay. So, and uh, the proverbial, uh, long story short, is that, well, here we are. Uh, and and uh, it's fascinating to me that that plants who, which I, I tend to talk about uh, other living entities as who, uh, instead of it, because to me they're, they're entities, living entities. Plants, they, they don't have anything reminiscent of a brain. We don't think they think. Although it's been found uh, uh, like uh, two weeks ago, uh, I don't know if you heard about the communication network of fungi. Mycorrhizal networks, yes. Exactly. So what are they talking about? I know. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, and, and it's fascinating because we haven't discovered everything. Uh, and that's part of uh, the coolness of science uh, and nature. That there's still so much out there that we don't know. And we probably never will. Yeah. I've been really interested in mycorrhizal networks recently. Um, I've been doing a lot of work on on fire ecology and how how forests kind of 
get affected by fire. But, you know, there's been well-documented cases of altruism within a community of trees where, you know, through the fungal networks, they're able to kind of communicate and sense, you know, which, which trees are healthy, which ones might need a little bit more nutrients or water. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of really cool, you know, the kind of the, the, the best things about that make us human, you know, plants are kind of already doing it, you know, and ahead of fire, sometimes these, these networks will be able to communicate like that there's activity happening and, you know, to kind of like prepare themselves for, for impact basically. But, um, uh, I'm sorry for interrupting. It's just that I remember something cool that I read that there's certain, certain plants that actually when they are being, I don't know, annoyed by an insect or something, they uh, release a chemical signal that attracts the predator of that insect. Oh, that's cool. Nature is so metal sometimes, you know, <laughs> it's ruthless. Um, so kind of this defense mechanism, I, I, in the book you call it chemopsychological warfare against animals. And, you know, so you've got plants competing alongside other plants for space, you know, uh, against uh, insects and then against larger animals. Um, the, the idea of the chemopsychological warfare, I mean, the, even the term is not mine. I, I wish I could have, it could have occurred to me because it's a really cool term. It was coined in the 1960s. And essentially those two, I, and I forget the name of the scientists, I'm embarrassed by now, but uh, they essentially, in, in a nutshell, they uh, propose that plants de evolve those mechanisms to confuse insects and get them kind of high or kill them. In a, or at any rate, they will leave the plant alone. This is a cool, fun way that plants are just a lot more amazing than we give them credit for, I think. Um, but one of the things that I, I, I was telling all of my friends about was the, the use of tobacco in birds' nests. And I, 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 that's just really stuck with me as just sort of a way, just one of those really cool ways that we, like what is going on there? What is happening there? Yeah, well, it's been uh, discovered that there's certain types of birds that uh, they just take uh, uh, used cigarette butts and they use the, the, that material to build their nests, and they preferentially use that. And there's some some other studies have correlated that with a, a lower incidence of uh, parasites uh, in in those birds. So, uh, and again, from an evolutionary standpoint, uh, the the explanation would be that this bird just by chance uh, found some cigarette butts incorporated in the nest. The parasites went down, but those birdies survived, and that tendency got conserved. But but then again, it's uh, even if we are able to explain it in evolutionary terms, it doesn't take an iota out of the fascination uh, mm -hmm. because they are using chemical warfare. <laughs> in the, they are co-opting a material in their environment for their own survival. Uh, Not only a material in their environment, but a modern material. Uh, exactly. A modern material that humans haven't really been using for that long in, in that form, I guess, as a cigarette. You know, so uh, like, I just thought that that was fascinating. You know, you can, yeah, you can say, you know, they were using the cigarette butts as a sort of structural integrity of the nest but you know the the way that they were able to document yeah be, because tobacco nicotine is a natural insecticide that these birds were having offspring that were able to survive without you know fleas ticks lice that kind of thing um but also that there were some genetic abnormalities that came from the presence of the tobacco plant so close to the the embryos but it wasn't enough to outweigh you know, the, the st stopping of the use of the plant in nests. It's, a, it's truly amazing. So that was one of my favorite examples in the book. But I wondered if we could talk about sort of, you know, intentional versus sort of, uh, well, I guess, re recreational versus unintentional drug use and what that line is. And, and if you can give us some examples of both that we maybe haven't discussed yet. Okay. So, uh, probably the best known intentional, well, recreational consumption of, uh, a psychoactive substance, substance is catnip. 
uh, catnip. And, and I have direct knowledge of that because I have two grandcats. <laughs> okay, so, because uh, my daughter, she has her own place, and we don't have grandkids, but we have two grandkids. Uh, uh, okay, so, and there's no nutritional value to catnip that we know of uh, for cats, and they, yet they seek it out. They uh, can get high, very doubly high, and, and they can show different responses. We can get into that uh, if you wish, uh, but that would be kind of the recreational part. Okay, there's even some organisms that can consume substances in a medicinal context. Okay, there there was a a, a scientist who actually proposed the idea, and he studied that in chimpanzees and in gorillas, that they ingested certain types of plants that were later found out to be antiparasitic, for example, or fever reducers, or even have antibiotic properties. Uh, okay, so in that sense, uh, they use it in a quote-unquote nutrition, semi-nutritional setting, but to cure a uh, malady uh, in, in them. Okay, and then again, uh, as far as intentionality, we have to go again to what we were talking about before. What's uh, what's the cat? Uh, my one of my grandcats uh, thinking when my daughter dangles the catnip you, you know do they get happy do they uh think uh i don't know long for the moment when my daughter comes back home uh, we don't know uh, we don't know that that's the uh, it's a little frustrating uh from the perspective of someone who wants to know but it's fascinating nonetheless do you think that because we aren't able to communicate with animals we'll never know or do you think that it's possible for us to answer some of these questions Probably the closest we are to communicating with animals are with primates and perhaps dolphins, actually, uh, because they are, uh, and even then, uh, and even then it's going to be, a, uh, it's going to be uphill. I don't know if we will ever be uh, able to effectively communicate in a reliable way. It's like uh, the old problem is uh, about what is it like to be a bat, okay? It's a, like a famous philosophical paper because we cannot possibly know uh, the mental life of a bat. First, because we're uh, mainly visual animals, uh, okay? We generally don't use like clicks on our ears uh, to detect uh, anything in our environment. We don't even know how bats will perceive that. Dolphins, for example, they will have an organ, uh, actually it's called the melon, but they uh, use echolocation uh, to navigate the oceans and uh, they can actually uh, put like a visual image based on echoes. Uh, I, I don't know how, how would that feel like. Uh, uh, okay, so it, it's, it's, uh, this has so many implications. All of them interesting, all of them interesting, but <sighs> equally frustrating. So I don't know yeah. if we will ever be able to communicate with, with them. You you know, we would be remiss without talking about the other um, title of your book, uh, Stoned Dolphins. Um, and I thought dolphins were a great way to kind of end the book because it's, I guess, dolphins are kind of an unexpected, maybe consumer <laughs> of substances, <laughs> you know, because there were there were a few examples that um, I kind of had recognized. There was that experiment they did with um, spiders and, you know, web weaving on certain substances and how the substances affected their ability to make cohesive webs or not, or different patterns that they kind of came up with. Um but stone dolphins was a, a new one that I hadn't really come across. Um, and and it, it is one of those that you differentiated as being more anecdotal and less evidence-based. But do you want to kind of get into what the heck is going on with these stone dolphins? Well, yeah, you're <laughs> absolutely right. I mean, this is uh, there's not a lot of research uh, in this uh, particular aspect, but I, it was too good to leave it out of the book. Okay, so that's uh, that's the first thing. Second, yes, it was a little frustrating because I couldn't uh, reference to a particular paper or anything like that. But the point is that a few years ago, there was a documentary uh, filmmaker and his crew went underwater to film a pod of dolphins, okay? So uh, they noticed that they were uh, nibbling on a pufferfish. 
So uh, a puffer fish is a, th there are several species, but they are all characterized by their production of a toxin, a really bad one called tetrodotoxin. Yeah, okay, so, and they saw the dolphins nibbling on the fish. Don't They didn't eat it. They nibbled it, gave it to the next dolphin, nibble it to the next dolphin, nibble it. And according to the interpretation of the filmmaker, they, the dolphin act weird, uh, as if intoxicated, uh, okay? So uh, the interpretation is that the dolphins were getting high on tetrodotoxin. So, but there's a few problems with that because tetrodotoxin, even though it has psychoactive effects in humans, okay, uh, is an, a bad toxin. Uh, but then again, dolphins are way bigger than humans, okay? It, it would be a matter of dosage. We may also think about the uh, physical sensations that tetrodotoxin induces in humans. For example, uh, in traditional Japanese cuisine, uh, fugu, one of the traditional fish that they use is puffer fish. And the attraction to the people who like fugu is that when they uh, eat it properly prepared, because when it's improperly prepared, there's been deaths. Yeah, you can die. Exactly. <laughs> So uh, they feel like a tingling sensation uh, in their lips and in their uh, tongue, which is reminiscent to when they put local anesthetics when you go to the dentist. And, and it's no coincidence because tetrodotoxin blocks the same types of uh, channels in nerve cells that uh, local anesthetics inactivate. Uh, okay, So maybe the dolphins like the tingling sensation in their lips. Okay, so but uh, I'm sure somebody's thinking about experiments about dolphins and uh, and I would love to see the, any results. Uh, but uh, then again, I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rather than, uh, you know, that 420 phrase puff, puff, pass. Maybe it's puffer, puffer, pass. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, any in, in your research, you didn't try puffer fish? Uh, no. You want to stay alive? I, I know too much. I'm, I'm a weirdest pharmacologist. I don't even like taking medications if I, if I can avoid it. Because <laughs> you know what they're doing and you know, yeah. <laughs> um, I guess maybe we could kind of wrap up a little bit more about your research specifically and um, the kind of research that you're currently doing, um, research that you maybe want to get into, and also how how you sort of dose these substances that you're using? What kind of substances are you using to do these experiments and, and what that's like and where you're going with it? What we do essentially, because the flatworms that we work with, they are freshwater and they are very easy to work with because we don't we don't need an incubator. They are uh, very hardy organisms. They, they, live in, they live in pond water. Uh, okay, so that's, a, 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 I mean, they're, they're resistant to many things. So what we do is, for example, we tested, we have tested uh, nicotine, uh, we use cocaine uh, in the worms too, uh, and we try to come up with uh, different types of ways in which we can measure the behavior of the worms in response to increasing dosages of those compounds, and then we can test experimental compounds to try to get them out of that uh, toxicity. Okay, and we have found a few. Actually, I have one tattooed in my arm. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, that that one is called parthenolide, and it has kind of a it's kind of a long story. But we found that that's a behavioral antagonist of cocaine uh, in the worms. In the worms. Okay, so uh, that may or may not pan out uh, for uh, mammals, but you know. Another thing that uh, I would like to try to develop is the idea of, of the pharmacology of regeneration. Because planarians are those uh, 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 those type of th worms that, again, you cut their heads up, they will regrow a new head. You cut a worm in 200 pieces, each piece will regenerate into a whole animal. But in terms of the head, they regrow their heads, but not only that, they regrow their brains correctly. Uh, can you imagine if we learn how to do that in humans? People with brain damage because of an accident, uh, 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 okay? Or spinal cord injuries, uh, uh, okay? So uh, nerve cells are notoriously hard to repair, 
uh, and in, in it, sadly most of uh, of the hardest cases is neurological damage. Uh, I mean, people can recover from certain types of neurological damage, but sometimes it's uh, it, they cannot. Uh, recovered. So, uh, planarians are masters of regeneration, and uh, I would like to to explore aspects of that at some point. And with planarians, I guess I'm wondering how how kind of people would read, or maybe people being me, but how similar are we to planarians in our hardware, and how how would we? Tr- you know, transfer that knowledge that we're learning about them into, you know, real world use into humans or other vertebrates? We are more similar than that we would think uh, because they have uh, a centralized nervous system, meaning that they have a head and the brain inside it. Uh, their brains, they branch out just like our nervous system does. They uh, display virtually every uh, neurotransmitter system uh, to the same the same ones that we use, virtually all of them, uh, most of them, I should say, uh, uh, most of them, and they react similarly to the same substances that we react to. Uh, okay, so, uh, and that's uh, a, a very good starting point uh, from, uh, it may pan out to humans, it may not, uh, but uh, it's like, well, my philosophy in life, uh, you already figured that out that I'm not shy. Uh, uh, so I'm not a shy person. I used to be, believe it or not, but I'm not. Uh, if I don't do the experiment, I will never know. Okay. If I don't ask nature a question, the answer will always be no. And that's, you know, why, why I do what I do. Mm-hmm. I bet you would be a really fun person to go on a hike with. <laughs> Thank you. Are, you. are you the kind of person that's, I mean, I, I am this way with certain things and I have a lot of friends that are into certain things, but as you're just kind of looking around, you're just sort of seeing nature in in these terms and in these contexts of sort of like. I love it. Even though I'm an avid indoors man, <laughs> I, 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 I love nature and I, I'm fascinated by it. I'm fascinated yeah. by it. Yes. Well, it, it totally comes across in the book, um, which, you know, I, I just it was just such a joy to read again. Um, and there are I'm, I could talk to you forever and ever about this stuff. So the science happens so fast and it's happening all the time. It's changing all the time. And as strict and stringent as it is, there, I feel like with more new evidence that comes out, there's flexibility for a, a lot of the concepts that you discuss in the book to change, you know? And I think I love that you're just so open to wanting a lot of these things to be possible. You know, even some of the the naysayers, some of the scientists that are the opposition to a certain theory are like, I kind of want that to, I, I kind of want to be wrong. That would be really cool <laughs> if that were true. Yeah, historically, um, historically, Almost every single time that a scientist, uh, and I'm paraphrasing another famous scientist, uh, that a famous scientist says, this is not possible, historically, almost always, they are wrong. (laughs) Okay, so uh, nature doesn't care what we think. (laughs) And nature is amazing, though. So we will kind of wrap it up there, I think. Um, Oh, and any websites or social media that you have that you want to share? Oh, you're going to love this one. (laughs) My website is (laughs) boldscientist.com. Uh, for obvious reasons, your your listeners cannot see me, but I uh, I uh, I have a beautiful bald head. It is beautiful. Yes, it is beautiful. <laughs> and I'm very active on social media, particularly Twitter, and I am at Bold Scientist. Mm. Oh, on that note, how do you feel about um, Elon Musk acquiring Twitter? I would have given him so many ideas for those $43 billion that, uh, that, I mean, it's his money, okay? So, but I would have done so many different things. Uh, Ending world hunger, homelessness, cancer research. There's a lot. Yeah, a lot we could have done with that. But we will follow you, um, One, on Twitter. Um despite that. But Dr. One Pagan, thank you so much for taking the time to, to chat with us on the podcast. It, it's been a, a, just a treasure having you. Likewise. Thank you for your kind words. It's been my pleasure. And um, thank you for giving me this treat to, uh, to, to talk science with a like-minded person. 
Let us know what you thought of today's trip with Dr. One R. Pagan by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts and joining the discussion on our social media pages at Earth to Humans Pod. Earth to Humans is a production of the Wildlands Collective. It's produced every other week by Serena Simons, Matt Podolsky, and Hannah Mulvaney. Our intro sequence was edited by Matt Podolsky with shouting assistance from the Foothill School of Arts and Sciences kindergarten class. If you liked what you heard and want to support the work that we do, consider joining our Patreon campaign for as little as $1 a month at patreon.com slash earth to humans. Audio samples used in the intro sequence were provided by the Macaulay Library at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and today's music is by Blue Dot Sessions.